Good day, everyone. It's uh, Terry Lynch here with Save Canadian Mining, and uh, welcome to the show. Uh, today's uh, show is on uh, battery metals. We're going to talk to some of our our, our uh, Save Canadian Mining uh, friends and supporters, and uh, learn a bit about the uh, battery metal space and and uh, how the pandemic is affecting it, and, and sort of market conditions and a number of other things. I want to invite uh, you know my uh, great panel that we've assembled today. Um, I'm never sure that when I when I watched this uh, my first replay, it, it it came across differently than when I described it. So I'm not exactly sure. So I'm going to get if you just give a wave when I call you out, then then we'll know that that's right. So I, in my view, picture, Nick Hodge is above me. Nick is with Resort Stocks Digest. There he is. He uh, used to be at Outsiders Club. Nick's one of the the premier newsletter writers in the business and. Uh, he, uh, when he speaks, a lot of people listen, and, and I'm certainly one of those uh, listeners. So, Nick, great to have you yeah. on. And Nick's been a uh, very early uh, investor and uh, uh, guy in the battery metal space. I'm sure we'll get some great insights from Nick. On my top right is Michelle Fontaine. Michelle's with Windfall Geotech. Michelle, you got a wave now. <laughs> Where's the wave, Michelle? There you go. There's Michelle. So, uh, Windfall is a very interesting company. So, Windfall basically. Uh, it is an AI company and it helps people find uh, deposits, including uh, companies like Canada Nickel, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, as we get into it, but one of the great uh, base metal places in, in, in the country today. And then finally, uh, not to be left for the last, Eric, uh, but Eric Sonscher. And Eric is, uh, you probably best know him as uh, one of the top uh, analysts in, in mining uh, for many, many years at Canaccord. And he's, uh, he's crossed the aisle. He's become uh, an entrepreneur now, an investor, putting his hard-earned dollars at risk. And he's now chairman of a very bright uh, uh, battery play we call Critical Elements. And we're going to learn about that when uh, when we get to get into the show. But gentlemen, welcome, and thanks for coming on Safe and Mike. Thank you. So, you know, I always like to open up the show with just, you know, a little bit about, you know, what is Save Canadian Mining? Why are we here? And, 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 and uh, basically, uh, I get uh, our host at 6X to, to put up a chart. And Jane, I'll get you to put that chart up, if you would. Uh, it, it's basically a, uh, a, a chart uh, that uh, shows, uh, we did a study, we hired, a, uh, we actually had Muren Beal Research on last week. And Muren Beal is one of the top, I would say, uh, you know, research houses, certainly in the, the precious metal space, but they're very, very competent research team. Anyway, we we had the suspicion that since the tick test was taken out, and, and what is the tick test? The tick test was basically up until 2012, in pretty much stock exchanges around the world, not just Canada, if you wanted to short a stock, you had to wait for the stock to go up. And so the tick, uh, tick test was that did the tick go up or down? If it went up, you could short it. If it went down, you could not short it. So, uh, what happened is that was put in place, you know, because stock markets were, were basically designed to allow people to, you know, access, you know, various forms of investment and allow companies to access capital. So capital formation was the key. Well, uh, the tick test made sense in that scenario, but in around 2012, the, you know, financiers and exchanges around the world had a concept that algorithmic trading and, and liquidity were, were going to be super beneficial to the markets. And for that to happen, really, the tick test was an inadvertent casualty. It wasn't just designed to take it out, but they, they couldn't figure out or didn't want to figure out the technology to, to sort of adequately sort of uh, handle it. So as a result, the tick test was taken out. So we did a study from uh, 2012 when the tick test was taken out to just last uh, February, March. And basically was very interesting since, you know, historically, and the chart doesn't go too far back in the past because uh, that's just the data that we could get from the the TSXV. That's just where it stopped before it became the, the old Vancouver Exchange, the Montreal Exchange, and the the old Toronto uh, TSC Junior Exchange. So so it just wasn't you know within our budget to try and make that math work. So this is what we could do, and what we found was that historically uh, the mining uh, index, the TSXV TSX uh, Metals and Mining Index, would typically have traded slightly at or above the, the commodity index which sort of makes sense, you know, in, in, in a way from a graphical perspective. But you can see, obviously, uh, you know, now on the graph, there's like a 60, 65 percent uh, difference. So, you know, the, the math of that to, you know, investors out there is that, you know, to get back to normal, 
mining stocks have almost have to triple across the board, which is a staggering sum when you think of it. But it it, it shows you how you know even though mar you know mine markets are coming back and we, we we're overall bullish on that, that there's still a structural problem here, and, and this is what we're trying to fix. We're trying to sort of you know advocate for the government to to make some changes in respect to that. So so I, I wanted to we can get rid of the slide now, uh, Jane, and I'll go back up to the uh, the screen. And I, I want to just go round the horn and, and just talk to uh, you know the guests and, and see, get their insight you know on 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 if they've got any personal experience with this and, and just what their views are. So Eric, why don't we start with you? What are, what are your thoughts on the uh, predatory short selling? Sure, thanks, Terry. I, I've been wondering for a while what it is that's caused us to lose our mojo in Canada, and by that I mean the fact that it used to be. 65, 70, even 75 percent of the money raised globally for mining, for exploration and development came through the Toronto and Vancouver exchanges, came through Canada. And that's certainly greatly diminished. We've also lost a lot of our, our premier mining companies. And just this week, we've seen Yamana go to the London Exchange and Australia has been eating our lunch on the exploration and development side in particular. And I think we were unique. We were unique in the way that the, um, the retail investor was strong, sophisticated, very active in the space. And that created the capital, the venture capital needed for exploration and development in particular. And that's where the real discoveries come from in the first place. So I think that there's a bit of a waning of confidence that the retail investor has the feeling, the sense that the, the foxes are guarding the mm -hmm. henhouse. We've been hearing a lot of moaning coming as well from the brokerage firms themselves with the increase in, in the number of non-brokered financings. And you, you'd have to be a little bit silly, a bit self-destructive as a company to signal the fact that you're going to do a raise when some of these parties turn around and short the stock, as you alluded to, and then cover in the financing. And that kind of behavior, whether it's brokerage firms or hedge funds or whoever, is a hell of a good reason for the companies to say, forget that, we're going to do it non-brokered. In addition, you've got institutions, some of the largest ones in the world, saying, yeah, sure, we'll do a private placement. We're going to give you the money directly. And we're going to cut out the middleman. We're going to cut out the, the middleman of the street. Yeah. Um, in effect, what's been happening is, is through the, the, the lack of, of the, um, the uptick, is that the, the golden goose that's made Canada what it is, the venture capital from the retail investor, that golden goose is getting slaughtered and all just for short-term gains. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's such a poor perspective that we're, we're losing that pole position in the financing on a global perspective. It's quite tragic. And that's something I, I definitely want to see reversed. We've got to get our mojo back. And a great start would be to see that, that tick test reinstated, not to mention some of the other 46 policy recommendations that's been made by the task force in July. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Uh, Michelle, what are your thoughts? No, I think it's uh, it's all about uh, transparency right now. Okay, uh, everyone want to be. Uh, if you talking about uh, when you are president and CEO of a of, of a public company, you need to to tell everything. Okay, you need to to be very transparent with everything, and all the insider that they, they know, you know, about the process, you know, to do uh, to give all this information. And uh, uh, but today it's uh, it's tough to to know uh, exactly what's going on and uh, and and the short selling is 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 one is one problem but I think they have more problem behind this problem and uh, and and I think it's uh, I'm sure you know uh, when you begin you know to talk about uh, this idea with uh, with Eric you know Eric Sprott. Uh, to to save you know and to begin to discuss about this problem it's a huge problem when you are a small cap company because uh, if you if you uh, you know I, I saw the last uh, you know the, the last uh, video you have done with Sean Rosen and uh, and uh, the president and CEO of uh, of uh, First Majestic we're not talking about uh, junior company okay. It's if these guy, you know, decide, you know, to if they check some some short selling, they begin you just begin to talk some trends. Hey, you know, we will squeeze these guys, okay, and uh, they will we will oblige them, you know, to cover the, the, the position. I cannot do that, 
okay and they can today it's with the algorithms yeah you know i'm using algorithms and we began to talk about okay uh, artificial intelligence in 2005 a lot of thing is okay you can you can do with algorithm is more mostly positive but this thing okay for trading you can trade the uh, you know 1000 faster than the, the, the trader okay and when you know exactly the patterns Okay, these you can. Uh, I, I have some of my guys here. They can do that. Okay, because we we work in 2009. Okay, to create something on foreign exchange, and I learn a little bit. You know how how the, these guy can 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 build an algorithm, and and to do exactly what the, the, this guy is doing. The the best trader. Okay, in uh, and they can you know check all the stock in the same time. Okay. And in 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 one second, you can check everything, and you can begin to trade. You can you cannot do that, you know, by, by yourself. Mm -hmm. Algorithm, they are there. We all know they are there to stay. But okay, we need to be. I think we need to be more transparent. What they yeah. mentioned yeah. before. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's it's tough. You know, every fund manager, we should know. Okay. Their long and their short position. Yeah, okay. fair enough. Nick, and, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's uh, uh, as you know, as an American and as a as a newsletter writer that 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 caters primarily to the retail crowd. I think the the Vancouver Stock Exchange has put a bad taste in the mouth of uh, retail investors for a long time. Certainly, uh, you know, prior to 2012, prior to the institution of you know 43101 standards, etc., and so. Uh, I learned the hard way, you know, coming up as a young kid who didn't know nothing about the TSXV and four month holds and was wondering why I was getting dumped on and my subscribers were getting dumped on four months after the uh, company did a financing and had to figure that out for myself. And so there's plenty of risks inherent in yeah. uh, junior mining and, and, and dealing in the in the uh, TSXV without the the predatory uh, predatory short selling that you're talking about. And I've seen it firsthand. Uh, uh, echo what Michelle was saying. I mean, I'm involved in companies that I can see programmatic shorts on this week. I mean, I just look in the line by line trading and see 500 shares out, 500 shares out, 500. I mean, you could see it bleeding it out on a program like Michelle was saying all the way to things you can't figure out. And you have to wonder, like, who is short offshore holding these shares and where did they cover? What numbered company has these shares and where are they coming from? I mean, these are definitely some of the uh, nefarious things that, that go on and that I've seen and had to deal with in, in my 12 year tenure of, of uh, dealing with junior mining stocks. And then, um, you know, there's other small things like I don't know if you guys have come across, but as an American, one thing I've had to deal with lately in private placements is the language in the legend removal form as far as um, have sold and will sell. Um, and of course, you're going to sell them. You, you bought the shares because you will sell them. But if yeah. the documents are written as have sold and you go to sell your shares, you yourself could be uh, made to buy back in because you're technically shorting the stock in that scenario uh, when you're selling, especially if someone uh, that you sold to requires or requests physical delivery. And so there's all sort of um, pitfalls and potholes to watch out for on the TSXV. And if we could give the regulators some uh, teeth and if we could do things like reinstating the tick test like say Canadian mining is after I'm, I'm all for that and I'm all for uh, transparency as well Michelle absolutely yeah those are all good points I mean when, when I, I was talking to the task force um, that's reviewing the Ontario Securities Act that has sort of prompted us to sort of push for it now uh, in the last week or 10 days and you know one of the other things they're focusing on which I'm also quite keen to support is uh, settlement because uh right now uh when you trade a stock you're supposed to t plus two and sell it in cash or or deliver your securities in two days uh the problem is there's, there's this plus 10 and 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 so they have this t plus two plus 10 so what happens is it's sort of like i forgot it's like the the dog ate my homework i, for, I forgot to bring my shares into the broker you know i'll get you know that was what that was supposed to be for but they trust me they've driven a freight train through that you know and, and the people just use it as a as almost like a kiting mechanism if you think about how people used to kite checks back in the day that you know bouncing banks around and you know because they weren't clearing it quick enough it happens in stocks and so what's happened is we've got effectively 
counterfeit shares out there where there's like, you know, 20, 30 percent more shares really in legal circulation than actually are issued in outstanding. And it's it's it sounds like insane, but if you actually look at it, it's the truth. It's crazy, you know. And and so Europe, uh, uh, I think, is sort of going to lead the pack in this. They they've come up with some uh, uh, new recommendations over there. I think they'll be put in place in September. I think, and uh, it's going to be T plus two plus four. I think, and basically at the end of the fourth day, if you don't have the stock delivered to the your broker. They're going to buy you in unless you have a contracted borrow. I mean, that's what's, I mean, the, it, honestly, the tick test obviously would be a great victory. But, you know, in many ways, if they actually enforce bloody good settlement, you'll get rid of a lot of these problems because they're, they're just, they're naked shorting the stocks and without real, without really paying for it. They're just keeping on papering it over. It's, uh, it's, it's, it seems uh, like something kind of a bad novel, but, uh, until you're until you look at all the stocks and you talk like I've talked to 30 40 executives and this is this is not one one person's problem it's like pretty much across the board and I've talked to pretty much the top short litigators and and people in the space and you know stumbled into this because I was pissed off myself you know and then then I've gotten like I feel like I, I had the red pill and the blue pill I'm not sure I took the right pill by getting involved in this but but I learned a lot more than I ever thought and it's like wow it's it's pretty deep so anyway it it I, I think uh, on the plus side you know regulators are are you know by nature they're not they're not speedy creatures, you know, you know, probably that's a good thing, but I think, you know, there's enough, uh, you know, the, you know, the antiques of, you know, purported antiques of Anson and, 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 uh, you know, we're seeing some of these very high profile, you know, obvious predatory short cases getting a bunch more exposure now. And I suspect that, uh, you know, regulators, both, you know, OSC and, and IROC are, are now really, recognizing there's a there is a serious problem and they got to do something and i think that's a good thing because the the governments are are motivated to uh to try and clean things up and and to get as you say michelle more transparency and and make it all as like eric sprott said hey you know how you get more investors back in junior money let them make money you know so yeah just treat them exactly. fairly he says there's never been a better time to invest in junior money in terms of well kudos to you for for making this <laughs> You know, you, you, you know what? It, it, it was funny. It was I was at PDAC. I can't remember. It was two years ago, I think. And uh, it was Sunday at PDAC, and you guys have all been there on Sunday at PDAC. And uh, it was like dead. You could have shot a cannon through the aisles and not hit anybody. And I'm there, and I'm you know you're talking to your booth mates. Michelle actually is a booth mate. He's like he's just down the road. And I'm saying like, Jesus, I know it's bad, but I mean, I, I had no idea <laughs> it was this bad. And, and and then I think I think it was Michelle that told me, he said, well, you know, PDAC is charging 25 bucks or 30 bucks to get in. I said, you gotta be kidding me. It's like, we can't give mining stock away and we're now trying to, trying to charge these guys to get in. Like, I thought that's what we paid booth rental for. So I went off on PDAC on that point. But, but then I realized, you know, in many ways, you know we're our own worst enemies you know we you know as junior mining companies i mean we we allow stuff to happen to us you know like we allowed like this tick test to happen to us okay yeah, yeah. and because nobody got together and said hey that's some bullshit. it doesn't work for anybody it's not it only works for offshore hedge funds and the banks that they partner with that get a big cut of it it doesn't work for individual investors it doesn't work for companies it doesn't work for communities how can that be good politics you know, forget it. It's bad business. We know, but it's also bad politics. So I thought, you know, because I was literally ready to leave mining at that point because I, I just, you know, been a long, ugly road, <laughs> mostly. Even I, and and I was just frustrated. I thought, you know, before I go, I should try and and leave it better than I left it. I just thought, like, I, I could try and make this one change. We could maybe help the sector out. And and I've always believed there would be eventually a mining comeback. And now we're here. I fully okay. believe macro-wise, this is, you know, our setup is never going to get better than this. And we we could make, you know, not only as individuals, but our investors, people can make a lot of money and money and will make a lot of money and money over the next uh, few years. This is going to be the place to be. 
but you know, uh, so it, you know, I, I think if we can all sort of pull together and keep the government focused, make some changes, then you know, it would really help our companies and help uh, help our sector, and and uh, that would be a good thing. So let's leave that for a sec. Let's, uh, you know, one of the things I like to do in in, in this is. You know, as an advocacy, and it's literally started in, in this little condo that I'm living in now, that I, a downtown dweller that moved, moved from the suburbs now that my kids are growing up. Um, one of the things we did was we, we, you know, we were able to get, you know, a bunch of like minded people to be, you know, helpful and to help out. This is just a pure, pure grassroots organization. You know, we, we put every penny back into the advocacy to our, our government relations people, to our agencies that are doing their work and whatever. And it's through their efforts and, and help that we've been able to, to make it. So we like to, you know, give back to uh, to the community and and and, uh, and learn a bit more about them. So so uh, this is a part of the show where I, I sort of go back and, and uh, uh, I want to, uh, you know, learn a bit more about uh, critical elements. Eric, why don't you, you, you tell us about critical and, and uh, give us your uh, your what's happening in critical and why it's a wonderful stuff. Sure, we will do. Well, our, our vision is to be a large supplier um, and a responsible supplier of lithium hydroxide to the EV and energy storage industries. I mean, I think we've all read about what Tesla's up to and, and behind that are, are Volkswagen and BMW and, uh, and Ford and, and GM and so on and so forth. And, and, and oddly enough, wonderfully so, is that we're seeing an actual increase of, ener of electric vehicle sales this year relative to last year, despite the fact that overall car sales are down due to the COVID crisis. Now, obviously coming from Canaccord Genuity before, I have a lot of respect for my, my former partners there. And I think that their work on supply and demand and lithium is, is better than, than the rest of the, the brokerage firms out there. And, and quoting their recent update just from a couple of weeks ago, they continue to see um, a 21% compound annual growth rate in demand for lithium going forward to 2025 and then ultimately we're seeing an increase uh, virtual tripling by 2025 of lithium carbonate equivalent in in demand now on the supply side of that they calculate that roughly 430,000 ton per annum capacity has been shut down or delayed in terms of expansions due to uh, a strike, if you will, in capital. And so that's a really, really positive thing that's evolving for lithium supply and the supply and demand balance going forward over the next few years. And I think most people buy into that. What's kind of cool is what's been happening and what came out through the battery day of Tesla. Tesla's obviously been the leader amongst OEMs, automobile manufacturers, in terms of reinventing how you build a car and distribute it. And they have now decided to move upstream, that they're creating a battery hub in around Austin, Texas, that'll include um, obviously the assembly of batteries, but also the manufacturing of cells that go into the batteries and producing the, the, the materials for the cathodes that go into those cells. And then ultimately also making the lithium hydroxide that goes into those. And, it, and it's key to point out that if we see the massive growth of European and North American cars, of EVs in particular, going forward, those require larger batteries for range and they require higher quality batteries, which drive the need for high nickel batteries in particular, and that that requires lithium hydroxide and that requires really pure lithium right so and, and although we've seen a growth in lithium production of lithium um, uh, spodumene concentrate in australia and that's created a, a inventory overhang in the short term that's pretty low quality stuff that really struggles to be upgraded to the purity the quality that's needed in biz so refocusing on critical elements we have the rose lithium tantalum deposit in quebec and that is one of the highest purity deposits in the world that's undeveloped at this point in time. So that's a real positive, the purity side of it. 
I think another positive is that while we've seen the emergence of a battery hub or are witnessing the emergence of that battery hub in Texas, there's a really strong case to see Quebec become the next battery hub. And the reason for that is the, the strategic geographic location servicing both Europe and North America as a lot of the OEMs and manufacturers, battery manufacturers shorten and regionalize their supply lines. But also you've got great human capital in Quebec. Mm -hmm. You've got real money. You've got capital that the, the Quebec government is now talking about putting 1.4 billion into this battery hub concept, starting with the miners. And you've got um, a, a power grid that's established mm -hmm selling power at 4.5 cents a kilowatt hour and that power is largely hydroelectric so a very low carbon footprint and in this esg world that's super important mm -hmm. so where are we at critical elements we've got a feasibility study for phase one which is mine and concentrator permitting for that should be around the corner over the next few weeks we're pretty confident about that the next step is to do a feasibility study for phase two which is that lithium hydroxide conversion, again, would be producing some of the purest lithium hydroxide in the world. So we're excited about that as well. Um, so all of that is coming together. Um, and uh, consequently, there's some really great um, news flow and some really great important catalysts. All that the Quebec hub needs right now is a really good champion to come in like Tesla is the champion for Texas. I firmly believe we're going to see a champion emerge, whether it's an OEM or a battery manufacturer, or even look at some of the oil and gas companies that are going towards the renewable side, um, like Lithium Americas, which has been a star in the lithium space. One of the earlier strategic investors in Lithium Americas was was Bang Chak Petroleum from Thailand looking to go green. Mm -hmm. So there's a host of potential strategic investors that will work alongside with critical elements to see this this emerging battery hub in Quebec. We're Great. quite excited. Great, Eric. Well, that's a good that's a good synopsis. I know <clears throat> the one thing that when I first got involved in the stock that that the singular thing that I remembered was at the time it had the lowest um, market cap to uh, feasibility study uh, uh, valuation, and I thought can't go wrong there if you actually think this thing is going forward and and uh, i believe it is going forward and that was a you know and i know you guys have, I think your stocks turned around and and uh, made a nice little run so i think there's uh, you know clear sailing ahead for you and wish you good luck michelle why don't you talk to, to us about windfall uh, geotech yeah i began in 2005 i was uh, the broker of uh, the president of uh, diagnose at that time and um and when he invited me uh, in their office, I was, uh, when I was broker, I uh, financed uh, many junior companies. That's why I had the, I was not a, a mining specialist, but uh, when you finance, you know, some, uh, some junior company, I can understand, you know, the big picture. And uh, he uh, invited me uh, at their office and, uh, and show me what the algorithms can, can do, okay, with uh, using uh, public data. And I was so impressed. I was just, wow, okay, if you can do that, okay, you can repeat that, you know, many times using, you know, different type of public information everywhere in the world. And uh, we began, you know, to, to, uh, to, to talk with uh, some of my investors, okay, some of my uh, clients, you know, that, that I, I finance. And uh, well, Dino signed two contracts with this, and the story began, you know, on my part. But uh, I decided, you know, to sell my book and uh, and and to uh, to start, you know, uh, promoting, you know, uh, using artificial intelligence in the mining sector, and that was uh, in 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 January two thousand five. So you're so you're an overnight sensation here, two thousand and twenty. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I, I can tell you when I when I began to mention and we're using algorithms, and at that time, you know, that was data mining. What? What? You know, uh, it's I can I can understand. You know, because it, it took me many, many months. You know, before you know I can understand exactly the power of all of, of the algorithm, they, what they can do. But today, after 15 years, okay, uh, because uh, windfall about you know all the the, the technology, all the the, the you know, patterns, because it, everything was inside. No? But uh, but I can tell you is uh, exactly. 
check. You know, the best example is you, Terry. You know, you just saw, you know, some result on your on your project in Chidi, and that was uh, it's very you know positive. But at the same time, if if I just check, okay, what we have done, okay, uh, for the last maybe five to the sixth last client, they went to validate seriously our target. They did something, okay. Our rate of success right now is more than eighty percent. But but algorithms, as you know, and when you begin to talk, okay, about using okay uh, AI, a lot of people, okay, my nickname at the beginning was Black Box. I checked Black Box, right? No, I was just I checked another Black Box. Okay, I can show you the, the patterns, and that's why uh, we never use you know neural network algorithm. It's a pure Black Box. That's why we create our own algorithm to be more transparent. Huh? We're talking about transparency. We need to be more transparent. But 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 again, it's today with uh, we all know, okay, uh, then algorithms and artificial intelligence they are there to stay. And one uh, one area where the people they don't use, you know, algorithms on the on their day to day. The only sector they don't use on the day to day is mining. Okay, in the petroleum and gas, in the healthcare, in the banking sector, everyone, you can talk about every sector, they're using algorithms and AI, but not in the mining. I know that they are very conservative, but I can tell you, okay, every, everyone will use the way that we're using the data right now, okay, because it's tough, okay, when, it, when it's covered by our burden by 5, 10, 25 meters, okay, you're talking about it's tough, you know, to be geologists today because all if you check in North America, maybe 99% of all the discovery was done 100 years ago or 75 years ago or 50 years ago because okay, one prospector or one one uh, geologist, you know, went there and they saw some rock on, on surface, on outcrops, and they, they took some, some some sample and and they found some gold there. But now the next one should be under maybe 5, 10, 25 meters of burden. And the only way, okay, mm -hmm. is to use many tools at the same time and use algorithms to digest and analyze all this good information. And as you know, geophysics penetration is going under maybe zero and 200 meters. That's why if you already found something on your project or if you are in the same geological trend, okay, then, a discovery on the mines, we can go to extract the signature of this area there and go to, to find back exactly the same geological context. And, and I can tell you, this tool is so precise that it's just fantastic. But I, I can understand that, okay, it's, uh, it's, it's maybe new for a lot of people, but for me, I spent 15 years of my life to promote this, this idea. And then <coughs> Ned Goodman okay, was behind us for many years. He was our biggest investor. And in 2011, when he came to our office, he just told us, because Ned Goodman, as you know, was a geologist, he told us, you know, I'm mining and they are very conservative. That will be a tough fight, but I know what you're doing is the future. And we are the future at 100%. So I, I understand now, like, you know, like I know, you know, Chile in full disclosure, we, we, we hired, uh, Michael's firm. I actually was at a technology conference that I met Michael at before PDAC, I think about two years ago. It was actually sort of when I started saying Canadian hey, mining, sort of a weird time of life, I guess, yeah. where I met some very important people. Uh, and I, I was at the conference when, when when you had the big nickel discovery that's become Canada nickel, really. And, yeah. and, and uh, you know, I was at this conference, didn't really know Michelle, and 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 then literally the press release hit and this, this big, uh, Big base metal discovery that's becoming a you know fairly hot play uh, now, and uh, so I, when I saw it in real time, I was like, okay, well this guy's not, you know, like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of bullshit in mine, and you guys all know this. <laughs> it's that you know that Mark Twain quote is is very still much in everyone's mind with the liar and the hole, you know. So uh, I I think there there is that, uh, but. But uh, yeah, when you see it in real life, and then you you go through you know the the many companies that have used it, and I, I think it's it's starting to take speed. And I see that you've changed your business model, like you're now you're taking stakes in deals, you know, and uh, you know you made the investment back in in Chilean, and, and because you believe in your magic, and that's yeah. really 
I think in, in some ways I see you more as a prospect generator with technology than, yes. than, 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 than just a pure technology play. And I think that market hasn't quite figured that out yet. And when they do, that, 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 that's going to be a good thing for your stock. So, uh, you uh, will see in the next uh, weeks and months, you know, we, uh, we will mod modify a little bit our business plan because, uh, as you know, it's a, it's a dream for me, you know, to do all the mining camps in the world. Because, uh, as you know, Australia, Norway, Finland, uh, we can have access to a, a big database, free, free data, data. And I can, yeah. I can stay in my office here, okay, and upload all the data. I don't need to go, when I, when we signed, you know, the contract with Codeco in Chile, I never went to Chile. We yeah. just received all the data by internet. And, you know, we just, you know, using our tool, and give that give back, you know, the uh, the uh, the, the target. uh, targets, you know, to uh, to their team and explain them, you know, using uh, WebEx or something like that. Very, very, very easy, you know, to to, to use. But and this COVID and you know, this vi when this virus arrives, I can tell you, you know, it's the best way, you know, to because you need to use all the tools today, then you can have access. Yeah, are just yeah. another tool. And we will always stay a tool. Yeah, yeah. no, it ma makes sense. Makes sense. Listen, uh, the last member isn't representing a company, but he's representing a sector that I'm a big believer in. And in many ways, the, the newsletters have become has replaced a lot of the analysts. You know, the the uh, and that's the, and obviously we have a a great analyst on side. Uh, and, and they're still there, but I mean, there used to be a lot of you guys. And now there's so few, you know, and used to be analysts would move stocks and there's still a few, like when Eric was there, he would actually move a stock, but, but there's, it, it, they seem to have less impact now than they ever had. I don't know why that is, but it seems like the newsletters, you know, the good ones and there's, 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 you know, uh, newsletters, I think some of them got some, some uh, bad rap back in the day when they were pump and dump places, but the good ones were they actually are working for a subscriber where your the subscribers pay and 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 the, the 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 analysts are just trying to find good investments both for themselves and for their subscribers and i can tell you that nick hodge is one of the best and that i've been uh, you know a long time subscriber with nick and made a lot of money with him thank you for midas nick i, I still <laughs> elizabeth yeah he's got a he's got a string of good ones now revival goal he's got some great ones but but nick's uh, now uh now starting a new entrepreneurial uh, I guess it's resource stock digest has been around for a while, but you and Gerardo. So right. over to you, Nick, tell us about uh, what's new and, ha and what's happening with the resource stock digest. A lot of good points you made there already back to transparency. Yeah. You know, you have newsletter writers that take cheap shares and don't disclose or they're in an earlier rounds and then they're promoting to their list. You know, we don't do that to Gerardo and I at resource stock digest and our new publications. We're transparent. We're writing checks into the deals. Uh, I financed Critical Elements personally, wrote a check at, at 30 cents and had my subscribers in at the same price. And in fact, if you recall, it, it dipped below the financing price for uh, just a second there. So I had retail subscribers in at 29 cents um, that have doubled their money or more in the in the in the past yeah. month. And so transparency is a huge thing, uh, uh, obviously, and uh, about replacing the analysts. Yeah, if you can. Uh, be honest and attract a loyal following of high net worth uh, accredited investors like a couple of uh, us have been able to do you can raise significant value i mean I've, I've raised tens of millions of dollars i'm not a broker but i i i'm a facilitator right i give access to my deal flow and so that's been great um turning to batteries you know i've been doing this the terry since 2008 i'm not sure if you know my genesis story i was hired to write blogs about clean tech back in 2007 and 2008 no. When the okay. Chinese solar stocks were on the back of the Wall Street Journal every day as the highest volume traded equities, right? And so I thought this was easy. I picked <laughs> BYD in China um, and made a thousand percent on that when I was, you know, 24 years old. And I thought cool. I was a rock star in the lithium space. And so and that quickly went away. And so, uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I've cut my teeth on the clean tech space. I, I co-wrote a book called Investing in Renewable Energy in 2008. I wrote Energy Investing for Dummies uh, in 2013. And then I went on to finance 
um, and, 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 and help promote some of the, the more successful lithium stories in the years. And we've had mini booms, right? So 2008 was sort of a clean, clean tech boom. And then we had a lithium run in 2016 that I want to talk about for a second. You know, I was able to finance companies like Lithium X at, at 15 cents and watch that get acquired at, at over $2 and 50 cents in five months. And so if you can make 1500% on your money in that sort of time frame, that's good work if you could get it. Uh, financed a couple of other ones that were highly successful. Millennial Lithium, we made several hundred percent on financed Advantage Lithium, which was ultimately taken out by Oracobre for uh, shares in a much more liquid producing vehicle. And now uh, here we are in 2020 having financed critical elements, right, with this um, sort of renewed interest in lithium. It's it's never really went away. The world has always been uh, going electric, right? It's just different iterations of it. You know, what Elon Musk was saying many years ago, I'm gonna source my lithium from North America. I was laughing at him, right? Like, no, you're not, guy, what are you thinking? Um, and of course he wasn't able to do that. And that's when all the South American plays ran. And now here we are five, 10 years later and what he had to build it himself to get the, uh, the lithium from North America, which has been wonderful. Obviously, you spoke about Austin, Texas, and, and, and Piedmont got the deal. That chart looks fantastic. Know those guys as well. Congrats to them. But what's next? Uh, what are the what are the next high quality sputamine deposits in in North America that have superlatives and that are um, in that development cycle where they're about to hit this part of it, right? Um, and that's like critical elements coming out of the of the permitting cycle, which we know is is if not. Uh, months or weeks away, right? And so um, I look for high quality deposits in the development stage. You mentioned uh, Midas and Revival, Terry. Those are both the uh, companies with established resources. Of course, Those yeah. are the things I like that I can sink my teeth into. Um, I've never been much on drill hole plays. plays. I'm not a geologist. I don't understand that stuff. But yeah. if I can look at a deal and, and look at the numbers and a proven resource and the team and their track record, uh, like Stefan ha Haber having sold his previous company, Rockwood, for $600 million or whatever that is, right? Um, those are the superlatives and the stories I'm attracted to and how I've had my success in clean tech and beyond in the past. And so I uh, had been attracted to critical elements, uh, thanks to you, Terry, for a while and, and watching along. And um, fortunately, this year had the ability to participate in a financing, which has go, gone quite well. And so, um, look, the world is going electric. They need uh, lithium. They need clean uh, nickel. They need clean cobalt. And if we can source that uh, in our in our own continent and, and know what that provenance is, um, I think those are the stories that are going to gain traction in the market going forward. Cool. Cool. Well, listen, I can uh, honestly give uh, Nick a plug. You go to resourcestockdigest.com. Check it out. There's lots of great uh, information there. Uh, there's a number of uh, services he offers, and it'll be the cheapest uh, dollar you ever spend. You're going to make your money back. So if, if you're an investor in the space, trust me, you need to have a few newsletters, and he's definitely one of them. So uh, uh, there you go. That. Yeah, it's the truth. I really believe it, Nick. So at this stage, one of the things that we'd like to do is we've, we've got an audience out there. They're, they're, they've been listening. And they've got some good questions, and we want to sort of tap into that. and and uh and flow through some stuff uh i got a question question from um richard uh he's he says can you comment each of you on the highlighting by issuers companies at constant news flow during corporate presentations to investors and investment community so uh eric what are, you, what are your thoughts i mean basically you know you know uh i guess maybe he's wondering about uh you know disclosure and and you know promotion <laughs> i'm not sure uh, promotion has a has a bad rap. I think there's good promotion and there's bad promotion. Right. Um, a, as an analyst sitting on one side of the table, you could get the full spectrum of good promotion and, and really abysmal promotion. And I recall getting phone calls saying uh, while the market was still open, we're reporting such and such an intersection with such and such a grade tomorrow. And you're going, what? Um, so obviously there is unequal disclosure that is a, a real problem for the for the retail investor. All you can do is look at the management group, look at their track record and have confidence that the better management groups play by the rules, do things properly, watch their disclosure and make sure that that all things are done on an equal footing. Um, that's that's primarily what I've got to say about it. And by okay. the way, Nick, it was Stefan Haber who was the president of of, um, of Rockwood when he sold that to Albemarle. It was for six point one billion US. Ah, I had the number wrong. There you go. Much more. <laughs> yeah, an order of magnitude. That's a good one. <laughs> I got a one. 
Got a well question done. from uh, Rob. Uh, Rob, uh, Rob has, says this, I use fundamental analysis and some technical analysis making my investment decisions. Yet based on comments, it seems that the weight of those offshore short sellers is overbearing. Clearly the deck is stacked against me. This is very discouraging. As a retail investor, is there any reason for me to invest in junior mining stocks? So uh, Nick, why don't you take that one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, look at what Doug Casey used to say. You don't want to take, you know, 100 percent of your portfolio and swing for the home run. But if you can take 10 percent of your portfolio and swing for that uh, 10 bagger, that's what it's uh, all about in the junior mining space. You mentioned, Terry, having a couple of good uh, newsletter writers. That's very important. Uh, you're talking about disclosure as well, you know. Um, it's not about going over the line. It's about just being in tune with the market and showing up every day and reading those press releases and, and reading between the lines, you know, determining, you know, what the management team is really trying to tell you and then um, figuring out how the market has reacted to that and determining um, if that's the right reaction or uh, the wrong reaction. Look, I'm a retail investor. I've made, I've had significant success in the, in the space. And so, um, if you look at where the next generation of minerals and metals are going to come from, uh, I know this is a lithium thing, but let's just look at gold and how you know people are out there. Sean Boyd, um, Mark Bristow talking about consolidation. Uh, Garofalo saying you know gold reserves are down fifty percent over the past seven years. Where's this next generation of supply going to come from? Well, it is those junior mining companies, and so if you can separate the wheat from the chaff, separate the lifestyle companies from the companies that are actually trying to develop an asset and move it forward and using that good promotion that Eric was talking about, not to create liquidity for themselves to sell, but to yeah. uh, build a company and raise money at higher prices. And, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and that's the, the teams you need to be attracted to. And, and, and that's what I try to do and get yeah. the retail investors into. And the other thing I, I would add uh, to that, Rob, is, is, is that you know, what's interesting in mining to, I want to, you know, I'm not saying there isn't cases that are still happening because it is still happening, but mining get crushed so hard. It's like that chart we put up, which showed that we're trading 65% below where we usually are. It's been, it's so devastated that in, and, and like still stocks are, have bounced off the floor because the floor was sub, sub, sub basement. So in many ways, they've done a horrible thing for capital formation. But in terms of value propositions, and, and all, I think everyone here, you can just look across the board. Uh, there's there's tremendous valuation. I mean, you're buying these things for pennies on the dollar now, and yeah, uh, yeah there's still the structural problem. But there's going to be some remedies. There, there. I 100% believe the Ontario Task Force is going to put some teeth into some new rules that will it will it, will it eliminate predatory short selling? No, I don't think that it'll ever get eliminated because these guys are crafty rascals uh, but I, I, I believe uh, it will substantially reduce it and that will be hugely positive for our stocks and in the interim you've got this generational you know commodity swing here that's going to be uh, you know it was coming anyway the commodity swing was coming and now the COVID crisis and the helicopter money is probably going to exacerbate it and, and like create even more commodity price drive so yeah I mean it, it's like in, in my mind, you know, get yourself some good newsletters, and 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 there is some great uh, junior mining stocks out there, and and get in them, and you know, yeah, the short sellers will be out there, but generally speaking, in the long run, if you have a really good company, you, 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 those those guys go away because you can't stop. If 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 uh, if Critical Elements gets its permits, that's going to become a mine. And that's going to be, when. yeah, yeah, when exactly that's my point. So, so it, it, it's going to be worth several fold, you know, and you know, uh, you know, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I think those and those things, it's not just critical elements, you know, I think the, 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 you know, the windfalls of the world are going to, you know, have, have an opportunity because of, of their new approach, um, you know, so anyway, so I think there's, there's, there's reason to be hopeful, uh, and it's about, you know, being intelligent and, and hopeful. So, the uh, boom was what we saw with the emergence of China, and that was a demand drive situation. Yeah. This time around, what we're seeing is not necessarily demand driven, although there's some great stories one can spin around demand. It's a supply, a supply deficit story. We had many years where there was a, a complete capital strike that we didn't see the expansions that we needed in, in mining. We didn't see the expansions and exploration required to keep that pipeline full. 
And so what we're seeing right now is supply deficits on the horizon and equities are going to respond to that, have already started to respond to that. In fact, lithium on average, lithium equities have outperformed even silver equities hmm. So yeah. since the COVID crash. Yeah, so sometimes it's good to get in at the very bottom. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's sort of uh, one of my favorite investment theses is going from bad to less bad, right? <laughs> you know, it's not, so so I, I think in many ways in mining, that's what's happened. We've gone from bad to less bad. We haven't, haven't gotten to good yet and certainly not to great. And I think those are coming. Michelle, we're going to have one so more question. One more question. Go ahead. Go we're ahead. seeing re-rating as these companies are, are developing, are coming into production as we address the supply deficit, but we're also seeing re-ratings on the valuations. A lot of these stocks are still very cheap. Yeah, they might be up by quite a bit, but they're still very cheap relative to many of the other stocks that are out there. Yeah, exactly, or if you try to duplicate it today. Michelle, one last question, and then we're gonna take uh, one, one more uh, section here. Uh, the, the question was from uh, uh, N. Han, not sure if it's, uh, you know, but the question is, please discuss your business model in terms of revenue generation. You know, shares, royalty, cash. There you go. Yeah, we began to uh, last year uh, after this discovery. You know, of uh, noble exposure, they, they, they become became Canada Nickel. Uh, we were the, the most traded stock, you know, on the TSX venture for the for the next, uh, you know, for the, the for two months. And uh, and how we can create more value for for our investors. And we decided to do some uh, to invest. Okay, to have the skin in the game in our client. That's why we uh, we began to invest uh, some money, okay, and to to own some shares. Because if we are so uh, if we are so confident about our target, our our client should get something. That's why you know we began to 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 uh, to own many shares of, on different company. Right now, our portfolio. On seven different company uh, and it's grown than 1.5 million, and we made uh, close to 450 thousand dollar with this uh, with this idea. And uh, but right now, if I check, okay, what what the uh, the, uh, the about the the all the the positive, you know, because it's 15 years we're doing this, okay. And I saw many cycle. I, as you know, mining is always about cycle. Okay, the cycle is good for a short period of time and is is uh, negative for some time you know eight uh, six seven eight years that's why i think i think what where we are going you know the, the cycle for for the gold and silver uh, we are there okay and we all know then uh, okay silver and gold should should go higher and after that that should should be you know base metal nickel zinc and, and copper and lithium and uh, but again it's uh, I, I think the best uh the, the next uh, on our business plan right now, what we want to do is to open an office in Toronto, and uh, and to begin, you know, to 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 maybe to begin, you know, to own some some uh, some a part of of the targets because the value is to own just not selling, you know, just our services is to own a part of the all these targets because we we know then. The value uh, on the company is is the claim that they own. Because if you cannot own the claim and you just uh, you know sell the services, how you can create value? And mm -hmm. that's why you know the drones arrived. We began to do some R and D with drones, and we uh, it's an idea I, I had in two years ago when uh, for the landmines we began to do some to use our technology to detect landmine using drones data because the resolution is so good. And uh, we began to do some tests. is is very impressive. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, and you will see, you know, more news about that. We we already okay. uh, signed an agreement with the Dragonfly, is the one uh, one of the biggest, you know, U.S. manufacturer, uh, drone manufacturer in the U.S. And uh, and we will begin to do some serious tests. Okay, okay. in the next, you will see. But again, yes. A lot of things would change for windfall in the next, but we we already spent five million. It's it's fifteen years, and the the know-how is so important. Then we uh, our team is the same since the last our our data scientists. They are there for the last fourteen years, and to keep our our our, uh, our team is I think is the key of the success. To it. We need okay. to be able to keep the team. Fair yeah. enough. We're going to have one more question, Eric, over to you on um, 
basically, have you been approached by battery uh, manufacturers, OEMs yet for the project? And what do you think needs to happen to trigger this? Yeah, I, it's fair to say that, that um, we publicly disclosed that we're working with our financial advisor, which happens to be Canaccord Genuity, on evaluating strategic opportunities. Um, when you go back the last few years, you can see that the road is littered with a lot of offtake agreements that are memoranda of understanding or letters of intent. Um, there's no equity participation. And, and frankly, they're, they're not worth an awful lot. And a lot of them haven't gone anywhere. Obviously, I don't include Piedmont's most recent offtake agreement. It's great to see, um, great to see Piedmont get a third of its potential production spoken for by Tesla. Obviously, we're looking at a lot of different opportunities where we could have looked at all kinds of low quality arrangements that wouldn't make sense for our shareholders. But the reality is that we want to tie all of this together. We want to have a strategic partner that comes in with skin in the game, that, that is interested in, in seeing that vision come through, not just for critical elements, but also in the province. And so it's a matter of staying tuned and watching what uh, what happens. Okay. I can't be any more. Perfect. That's, that. that's good. Listen, that's uh, thanks everyone for the questions. Uh, wish we had more time, but we've got to wrap it up. We've got five minutes left uh, before we uh, we check out. And we always like to check out with uh, what I call the stock picking. <laughs> so I go around the horn and uh, obviously, you know, one of the benefits of, of having industry people is uh, they're in the thick of things, so obviously we don't ask them to recommend their own stock because we know that you obviously recommend your own stock. You, you believe in that every day. But uh, um, And today we're, we're lucky because we actually have a professional stock picker <laughs> in, in Nick. So uh, without putting uh, everyone on the spot, but Nick, you're, you're used to being put on the spot. So give us, a, give us a pick and it just, or, or, or a couple of ideas. What are, what are, you, what are you liking these days? Uh, Chicana Copper is drilling a property called Soledad in Peru right now. They've had uh, drilled uh, about 15,000 meters in a couple of breccia pipes. They have over two dozen breccia pipes. They're uh, high grade mineralized gold, silver, copper, uh, you know, one, two percent copper. Dave Kelly, who runs Chicana, says some of the early holes they put in those breccia pipes were some of the best holes he's ever seen in his career as a geologist. Several hundred meters of multi-gram gold, silver and multi-percent copper. Um, they're embarking on a, a drill program right now. They just released high grade channel samples last week. We should start getting first results next week. And in this market, I think the results that Chicana will deliver will be market moving. Perfect. Thanks very much. Michelle, what are your thoughts? I can tell uh, I have uh, many ideas about that, but the first one is uh, I began to accumulate, you know, physical gold and silver maybe three years and a half ago. And I, and I think everyone should, uh, should own a little bit. Okay, I don't want to tell you to, to, to own, you know, 20% of your portfolio on physical gold and silver, but you should own a little bit. You know, it's a, it's a kind of, a, it's again, it's a way, you know, to do a good uh, diversification. And, um, you know, the, right now, I think my best idea is maybe uh, diagnose, okay, because uh, we're working in the same office, okay, their stock okay, was uh, ADK. Okay, they're simple, and uh, the, the just uh, maybe one month ago, okay, uh, a new chairman arrived, and uh, this guy was vice chairman of Sierra Capital, and he was in, and before that he was living in Asia for uh, I think the last ten years, and he was in charge of the healthcare, you know, fund for Goldman Sachs, you know, for many years. As you know, it's always a, a question of contacts today, and uh, since you know uh, Vincent is there, you know. Uh, uh, the stock, you know, he was at 15 cents. Now he's you know, he just gets 65 cents in in one month. Okay. Well, and uh, well, I needed that pick two weeks ago, three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but again, it's uh, it's a it's a good thing because what we're doing that is exactly what we're doing. You know what? We're, we're gonna we're gonna gonna cut you off just because we're, we're we're running out of time, and I want to get to Eric's pick, Eric. Yeah, I obviously since I can't talk about um, I can't talk about critical elements and I probably under your rules shouldn't talk about GR Silver, which I'm on the board of, which I also love. Um, so I'll, I'll throw three names at you very quickly. Um, these are all three in my PA, so forewarned. Um, Awale, which is ticker ARIC, run by the same management uh, that sold Hodmaden 
um, to Sandstorm. Uh, it's a project that they're doing very well with in Cote d'Ivoire, great results that they're getting there. Number two is, is um, Orzone. I own the warrants there. Orzone is advancing the Bombore project. Um, superstar president and CEO there, Patrick Downey. Um, great project, very low cost, and I think is probably a takeover target. And thirdly, I'll say High Gold, ticker H I G H, which has got the high grade Johnson Track project in Alaska where they're getting super results and some really interesting Timmins area projects as well that are high grade. So I'll leave those three names in addition to my directorships. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, well, um, you know, it's funny. I obviously, uh, last when I first started this exercise, I, my first pick was CRE, which I disclosed that I was a shareholder of and, and a fan of, and it's, it actually went from, I think it was 30, and it went, as, it, as Nick said, it went down a little bit, and then it ended up, and it's had a good run, and, and obviously doing very well. Still a believer, still still haven't sold a share. Uh, I uh, I like Scotty Gold. They're they're a golden triangle uh, play. Um, both to have some results out. I mean, it's it's a results play, no doubt. But they're 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 in some. I mean, I, I, we've just made an acquisition in that area, so I like that area a lot. We've, and we've done a bunch of work on it, so I I'm a believer in that. It's not bullshit that that there's a, there's a serious uh, mineral flowing there and. So that's my one. I, I like that for uh, a speculation. So, so that's it. You Listen, guys. guys you know Mark Twain was a miner before a writer, right? That's why he <laughs> was paid against them. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 I was in. Uh, I'm trying to think of the town in California where they, they have like they've re remade like the town into like a uh, like a gold mining town and you can go and they actually, he went there. It's where they, they had a silver strike gold strike back in the day, like loads, lodestone, or it's like, it's one of these edited the Western novels. And I went there with the kids, you know, Nick knows my son. And it was such a, just an, an amazing experience, you know, to sort of see how, and, 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 uh, you know, I mean, gold mining, there's, there's so many great stories, right? There's so many great stories about, you know, and, and uh, the, the, the truth is often stranger than fiction. You know? So anyway, it's, it's interesting times, but uh, thanks everyone for being on board. And uh, if you want to help save Canadian mining, if you want to help your own investment portfolio, please go to savecanadianmine.com, join our site uh, and, and support us if you can. Uh, but, you know, mostly just tweet it out. Like, like we need to get exposure. The world is waking up. Our investors are waking up. Companies are waking up. And we're going to do a lot more over the next uh, month or so to really push this because there's a chance and there's a really good opportunity for the government to do the right thing here and make a more even playing field for individual investors and for individual companies and for us to create real jobs and, and growth for our community. So anyway, with that, I want to thank everyone. Thanks to the panel for coming and uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. Cheers for now. Thanks for having us, Terry. Okay. Good weekend. Bye.